Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of Pat Chats, uh, my podcast uh, that is slightly rudderless, slightly directionless, um, but is a great excuse for me to make friends uh, with the people that I interview, or at least acquaintances. Um, no, actually, I think one of the fun things that I'm enjoying about uh, doing the podcast here in Berlin and uh, about doing comedy here in Berlin is it's um, a very diverse and international scene. So, um, you know, last time on the Pat Chats, uh, we talked with Abibsha, who is from India, and uh, the week before that, uh, we talked with Rob from Ireland. Uh, and now this week, uh, we are going to be talking with Bruno Mazzini, uh, who is from Peru and uh, grew up in Peru. And uh, so we it's, it's one of the things I enjoy about the comedy scene here is, yeah, you get to hear people from different places, their perspectives, their senses of humor. But there's also this through line that like people from all different places uh, all around the world, uh, we share this thing in common, this, you know, um, bottomless need for attention. Some might call it or, you know, others might call it a, a love for an art form. Um, still others uh, might call it just, you know, uh, a silly streak. Uh, so anyways, we, we share that, and I think that's kind of a, a beautiful and interesting uh, thing. So uh, this week, I, I got a chance uh, to talk with Bruno. I mean, actually, it wasn't this week. Little production secret, sometimes I pre-record the podcast. Um, so anyways, uh, a, a few weeks ago, I, I talked to uh, Bruno. He, he was kind enough to, to come over, and we, we discussed um, his his childhood uh, growing up in Peru, what that was, what that was like, um, his relationship with his sister and um, his experience, you know, coming over uh, to Europe for the first time during his bachelor's uh, studies uh, and then uh, now uh, coming to Berlin and uh, starting comedy. It's also a podcast where we really we really get into talking about comedy. You know, he talks a little bit about um, what it, the comedy scene is like in Peru now, which I'm always super fascinated about that. Like, what is the comedy scene in, in different countries? Um, and, uh, and we also talk about, like, the first uh, comedy stuff that he connected with as a kid, you know, uh, what movies, and, and, and then, you know, how he discovered stand-up and started getting into that. And... Uh, so we talk we talk a lot about that kind of stuff, and uh, I'm I'm continuing with the theme of having the guest uh, choose a comedy special that we could discuss. Um, I'm soldiering on with that for now, um, and so Bruno chose uh, Tom Segura's special Ball Hog, which I had a lot of fun rewatching, and uh, so we at the end of the episode we we talk about uh, that special and and just about uh, Tom Segura as a comedian and um, and so yeah that was that was the special we discussed in this in this episode and uh, yes it was a really it was an interesting conversation I had a lot of fun I hope that you guys are going to uh, enjoy it I hope you know that's the point is uh, for you people to enjoy it whoever you people are besides my parents and um <laughs> i'm just kidding my parents don't watch this uh but so uh you know normally i would just um stop there but uh you know for today's intro i thought i'd go i'd go a little long you know uh and and talk about me because the podcast is going to be all about bruno and um i am a bottomless uh pit for attention and needing to talk about myself so uh, which was something I took away when I re-listened to my podcast with a beep I was like ah, I was talking over her quite a bit um, some like I I ask a question and then I like like to go on about the question a lot and it's something I could improve at anyways uh, so what did I want to tell you guys I got my first haircut in seven years today I think in seven the last time I got a haircut it was 2015 
Barack Obama was president the last time I got a haircut. Um, and uh, actually, my hair uh, didn't start as like a fashion choice. It was just like a poverty choice. I was super poor. Uh, I was living out of my car at the time, like on purpose, but still I was quite poor. And I just thought like, ah, paying for haircuts is silly. I could spend this $20 a month that I'm using to get my hair cut. And I could just stop cutting my hair and then instead spend that $20 on weed. Um, because that's, you know, where my priorities were at that point. Uh, and then, you know, my hair grew out and I was like, wait, this whole, my entire life, I didn't realize actually I'm a long hair guy. Uh, I never knew. And then I became quite vain and, and fond of my hair. Um, but I also never saw, I was like, well, my hair is fine. Like, why, why do I need a haircut? It's like stopped growing. And so it seems fine. Uh, but apparently, uh, it turns out it's, it's better if you like go and they have them like trim the, the tips and, and whatnot. And, um, I guess I kind of buried the lead here. Uh, I'm getting married on Friday. So, uh, so I, I had my first ever haircut, uh, you know, for the marriage so that I can look good for the, for our the one person government official and then our hired translator who's coming to our, our small government, uh, wedding. And, um, so yeah, uh, I, I feel ambivalent about it. I do feel like my hair looks different and I don't know if I like it. Um, and, and I'm a little sad to have broken the streak. I had a, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I have some like tendencies or fondness towards, you know, uh, anarchist rhetoric, but really I'm like kind of a basic, big, basic bitch capitalist, you know, like I do love a fancy hotel room. I do. I like, I do like, like just, I like nice things. Um, and so I like to think like, ah, I'm not part of all that, but no, 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 I am. And so I feel like me not cutting my hair. I, I feel like what I like to do is take things that are that I'm already doing because I'm lazy, like not buying new clothes or not getting my hair cut, uh, and then try to you know subvert it so that instead of those things being just a fact of my laziness uh, and in general ineptitude at adult life, uh, that uh, that I then make them like a, 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 a like a moral stand against capitalism. Like I'm just like not even buying new clothes right now. Like I've just like stopped buying new clothes and like, I don't even cut my hair because I just like don't want to buy into that system. Um, so yeah, that's my deal. And, uh, and I felt like, you know, it's my podcast and, and I want to talk about it. Uh, so that's the news. The big news. The biggest news is obviously I've gotten a haircut. I guess um, below that would be um, that I had a nice chat with Bruno uh, a, a couple weeks ago. And uh, then below that, I would say is that um, uh, COVID numbers are like going through the roof here and everything is getting like shut down and fucked up again. And I'm like teetering on the e edge of like a black hole of depression about it. Uh, but I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, and then below that is, uh, I'm getting married. Yay. I'm going to be Mr. Moore. Um, and so that's, that's exciting. Uh, I forced someone to put a ring on it. You know, like, if you're going to put a ring on it, if you're like, you're going to put a ring on it. So yeah, so we're putting a ring on it. And, uh, so that's exciting. Um, of course, now today we found out like our little like kind of half honeymoon thing going to like a super nice hotel spa. That area has been shut down and the, the hotel has been closed. So we'll see uh, how it all comes together, how special it all feels uh, when the big day comes. Um, but yeah, I got my haircut. You guys like it? I don't know. Get in the comments. Let me know if you like the haircut. Okay, I just wanted to do like a fun, longer, little more, uh, little longer intro, a little bit more, 
self-indulgent. I literally just enjoy hearing the sound of my voice in the headphones. I really, I dig it. Uh, I like that. And um, so there we have it. Uh, apologies to Bruno if you thought I would do like a nice succinct intro for you that would be you know like focused on you as the guest but I focused on you for like an hour and 20 minutes so uh, hopefully you know that this is uh, this was enough uh no I uh let's let's I'll shut up now and let's get into the episode uh this is my conversation with the lovely and very funny Bruno um follow him on all of his social medias links in the description below if you're in Berlin by all means, come to see his show on Wednesday. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, it's at a very cute little venue, and it's a great show. Highly recommend it. Uh, link in the description below. All that good stuff. And without much further ado, here is my conversation with Bruno. Okay, so uh, to start, can you uh, just like introduce yourself, tell us your name and okay. a little bit about yourself? Okay, my name is Bruno Mazzini. I uh, am from Peru, but I have uh, mostly Italian grandparents or great-grandparents, so I have uh, Italian nationality as well. I uh, is know. that on your mom or your dad's side? Both sides. Both sides. Yeah. Ah, so both of your grandparents are Italian and then they... Or great-grandparents. Your great-grandparents. Your great-grandparents. Yeah. Uh, and so then your grandparents, uh, they speak Italian. Okay. Then my mom spoke it, uh, speaks Italian. My dad didn't learn it. Um, and none of my generation does. Yeah. I guess. yeah. Uh, so, but that's interesting. So like, is there like a population of Italians living in Peru? Yeah. 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 For sure. There's a lot of immigrants in Peru. Uh, and, uh, one of the bigger communities I would say is Italians. Mm hmm. There's also a random German one around. Uh, what? Where could that be from? <laughs> yeah, actually, it's it's from that time. They, they went into the jungle. And yeah. There's like a place. There's a town in the jungle where everyone's white. Really? Like super white. But they're Peruvians for a couple of generations now. Yeah. But they're like still super white. So Interesting. Yeah. So in, is that like, I didn't, I I mean, this is like classic, uh, maybe American ignorance. But like I did, I wouldn't have thought of Peru as like a, big country of immigrants necessarily is that like does that play out in like the social uh social structure like in school or politically or any of those things um so i yeah it does for sure but like i would say that all of the americas are, yeah. are like countries of of uh immigrants because like whenever there was like a a famine that it, the Italians, it, the Italians, for example, came during the Great Famine, which was, I think, after World War One, or maybe uh, okay. it was before. I'm not sure. Uh, but like famine, it's fine. It's not a history podcast. Yeah, yeah. You move, <laughs> you move to the cheaper place, yeah. basically, which mm -hmm. is the Americas, and and uh, I don't know. We have a lot of Japanese people as well. Uh, I don't remember why that one was. We have a lot of Chinese people because when slavery was uh, banned. Uh, you would hire uh, Chinese people, but under like slave-like contracts. Oh shit! Uh, the, it happened in the U.S. as well. I recently yeah. found out in like the railroad. Yeah, camps. yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, so we have a ton of immigrants like that, and uh, everyone's racist in Peru. So, ah, okay. <laughs> so it, it it does play a part in like that. Uh, the wider you are, the more like. Uh, European you mm -hmm. are, the more privileged you are. Mm -hmm. Usually there's a correlation and also you just get more like uh, like uh, more of a free pass. Yeah, or something. exactly. Yeah. Like you you don't uh, get looked at like a criminal or you don't get that people trust you more easily. But it's funny. Maybe this happens in more places, but I felt it in Peru that in Peru it's like everyone is racist. Yeah, like it's really been established by since colonialism. So like. Uh, they established kind of like a case system, the Spanish, or not a case system, but like a ranking. Yeah. So then the 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 kind of brown person would make fun of the browner person. Yeah. So that, like that that shit uh, was really established, and in Peru, it's like 
uh, everyone is is uh, has that ingrained into their mind, and it's really recently starting to like be, be talked about, or yeah, be talked about, and people are like trying to re re vindicate, re yeah, the like change change the system basically exactly like yeah. and like be for example we for a lot of time we had we were ashamed of a peruvian culture native peruvian culture mm -hmm. and now recently it's like becoming a thing where people like are proud of it mm -hmm. but for the longest time everyone would try to like dress european or, or stuff like that even like poor people and yeah uh, and uh now now it's cool to be like to, in, yeah be like in touch with your peruvian roots or yeah, the culture yeah, yeah. or yeah so where, like, where did you grow up specifically? Like, did you grow up in, like, a city or a town yeah. or... Big city. Yeah, a big like city. Lima, so... Ah, Lima, okay, yeah. So, like, 11-ish million people, city. Yeah, and what... Uh, I've never been to Lima, but what what is it like? I mean, is it, you know... Uh, yeah, what is it like? Uh, horrible traffic. Like, <laughs> okay. Some of the worst in the world, very aggressive. Uh, polluted... Um, uh, kind of dangerous. Not, not. Uh, I guess by South American standards, it's relatively safe. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but for any European or or American, I would say very dangerous. Um, fun. There's a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. There's like a lot of of and everything to do. There's a ton of bars. There's a ton of like concerts and stuff like that. And. Uh, what else could I... Best restaurants in the world in Lima. Really? That's the, yeah, if I have to, like... If you have to brag about Lima... Yeah, yeah, like... yeah. Everything is horrible except the restaurants. I, I love that, but... Uh... And so what... Uh, I'm always, like, uh, interested when I meet somebody who grew up in a city because, like, I grew up in a kind of, like, a smaller town. And so, like, when you were younger, did you, like... Did you guys just stay in the neighborhood? Could you like go out and play and uh, that kind of thing? No, or no going out and playing. It was more like go to your friend's house, and then your friend uh, maybe he had a park that he was used to going and playing, and mm. you would go with his like nanny. Yeah, uh, if he had one. Otherwise, you wouldn't go out most yeah. likely. But uh, and like and so then at what age could you start to like have that like freedom to like go out by yourself with your friends like it it started like at 13 14 yeah but uh to like specific places yeah you know like we were going to the mall or yeah something, for example the mall was a thing mostly though because it was safe you know yeah. like if your kids are at the mall you, you know where they are and you know what they're doing and stuff uh, stuff but uh yeah, 13, 14 for that. And just leaving the house and nobody asking where I am, more like 19 or yeah. something like that. Like, I went to university in the same place where I uh, grew up in Lima. So I still lived with my parents. Mm -hmm. So, but at the, like, really after university is when I could just leave and they, they didn't ask anything. Yeah, or worry or, I mean, I guess parents are always worried. Yeah, they are. They, they are. are. <laughs> they are. <Yeah. laughs> But so, um, uh, what, uh, did you have siblings growing up? Yeah, I have a half sister, but she lived, uh, with, with her mom. And then I had, uh, my sister, like a hundred percent sister, mm -hmm. uh, which I lived with an older sister, two years older. So yeah, I lived, I grew up with her like my whole life until she went to university in Argentina. So she, so she left. Yeah. And then the bruises could go down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you heard, you heard the bit. You yeah. heard the bit. No, yeah. yeah she really, um, actually, that bit is uh, uh, ha quite historically accurate. In that, after the first time I beat her up, she never beat me up then again. Then she left you alone. <laughs> no, she, uh, the psychological bruises never stopped. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but the like, she was still torturing me. Yeah. But in a more, she had to change lanes. She yeah, was yeah. like, okay, the physical thing isn't gonna work anymore. I gotta figure out a new way. But no, nobody loves you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's always a funny thing to me, is like, because I'm an only child, you know. And like so much of my life, I was like, ah, oh, like I want, I wish I had siblings or whatever. But then, like you also then realize, 
like when you talk to kids who had siblings, it's like, yeah, and sometimes that wasn't that great either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, of course you have this like nice, I'm no, sure, no, love no, for each other. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, uh, um, no. Uh, I, I, there, it's a spectrum. It's yeah. It's a spectrum. And I started off with a terrible, like, I remember people telling me, Bruno, all siblings like uh, annoy each other. And I was like, no, this is, this is like straight up. Like no, no, there was no reciprocation of the yeah. like she would d destroy me psychologically, <laughs> and I would try to be nice, so maybe she would stop, and then she never did. Yeah. So like for a, a long period of time, I was like, do I even love my sister? You know, like it, there was none of that shit. And now now we get along super well, and yeah, uh, and uh, I I can say I love my sister, but for a while. That, like no just it's did, straight did up did you no. guys ever like talk about or like come yeah. to some peace about this period like did she say like yeah okay i was i, for, with I you. forced her to apologize basically <laughs> because like she started like realizing the stuff that she had done wrong and stuff like that yeah but she like played it off you know like, yeah she just pretended that uh that she had never done anything you know while she was living in argentina she would come back and because we had our own space, it would be more chill. Yeah. But then she would pretend it was all good and stuff like that. And I was like, it's not, you know, like, yeah, all of this shit still happened, you know, yeah. like 90 percent of my therapy <laughs> sessions for a while were about her. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so so like I, I basically told her once and I remember she was with her, her friend as well. And I was like, yeah, no, like you really fucked me up and you know this. So I apologize, like take the time to actually acknowledge this and apologize. Yeah. And she acknowledged it. She apologized and she gave me a gift, a present, which was a, her, her weed kit, <laughs> which was super sweet, actually. Yeah. And uh, I still have it. It's like uh, <laughs> something that has sentimental value to me now. She's like, here, deal with your psychological pain. <laughs> Basically, if you're high, you won't feel it. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was super nice. And then like after that, I like we've still like revisited the topic sometimes, but with with way more air to breathe. Like it, it's not a tense thing anymore. She apologized and like it. Like I let it go. You know. Yeah. I, I don't. Do you think like do you think your parents realized like it was as severe as it was? I mean like. If you were, like, really talking about it in therapy, then it's, like, it was fucking... Yeah, but my mom was, like, a sing like a single, divorced, and, and working a lot. Ah, uh, okay. So she did the best she could, but she was... I don't know. She, she no... Yeah. She, she was busy. She was busy, and she wasn't as uh, tough as I think. I mean, I don't know how to raise children either, so... I, yeah. <laughs> but in my opinion, she, she could have been way more uh, strict with my sister, and she wasn't. But she tried her best, you know? Yeah. And then my dad was uh, kind of not out of the picture, but we didn't see him often enough for him to, like... Be hands-on. Yeah, he, he would be like, stop it while, I'm, while, while we were at his place. But that was, like, once every two weeks on a weekend. So, yeah. so that doesn't really change the dynamic, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it made me who I am. So I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. To be fair, I'm happy. Uh, and so were your parents uh, like ever together while like you remembered or were you did you growing up? Were they already always like separated? Yeah, they, they separated it when I was four. So so no, yeah, no remember. <laughs> and uh, was that like uh, how was that? Fine. Uh, I never really like took it personally, I think. I, I, there's a comedian in Nathan that has a really good bit about it. That's like when you're when you're like a baby, and if your parents get divorced, it's your your fault probably. Oh yeah. The older you get, the less you blame yourself. But uh, I I didn't actually blame myself at yeah. all. Uh, for a second, I doubted. I was like, maybe it was me. <laughs> but then, like, no, I didn't blame myself for anything. And uh, and uh, honestly, I think. The way I see it, like for children of divorce, it's like if if a divorce was like better for both of your parents, then it was probably better for you too. Exactly. Yeah. Like if you're raised by a sad person, you're going to be sad. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess what I mean more is like, how was it like, like when you were going to go over to your dad's for the weekend or something, was it like, oh, fuck yeah, like 
you know, going to dad's, like he's going to let us do more, get away with more yeah, shit yeah, yeah, for or sure. for sure. Yeah, it was, it was a, yeah, it really was like, we, we would go for like fast food or like pizza and shit all the time. We would like, I would binge watch uh, TV and he would never be like, Bruno, get out of the yeah. house. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> I remember I, I really got into Naruto, the anime. I don't know this. You don't know? No. How can you? This is the most popular anime in the Well, anime. I don't really know anime. I'm you sorry. You should, Patrick. You should. Like, a self-respecting man, you should know. I don't know. It's not the type Asian of anime King. I'm into. Asian cartoon. A <laughs> porn. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's keep it. Let's keep it mature. Come on, Bruno. All okay. right. No, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's more mature than porn? Well, yeah, <laughs> okay, that's fuck? true. I'm actually, 18. Actually, <laughs> anime porn is usually very, very youthful. You yeah. say. <laughs> to say it in a polite manner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so your dad, so you, you would binge anime at your dad's house, like hours on end, uh, and and he would be like, "Hey, Bruno, I'm I'm happy you found something you like so much." Which, to be fair, like good, 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 good approach. On, yeah. But at the same time, I was watching like 18 hours straight <laughs> yeah. of something. Or when like my, my whole family and my dad's side was like super uh, like Potter heads. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister was like the third person. My my half sister uh, was the third person in Peru to have the last book, the seventh book. Oh, shit. And she read it in like a weekend. Uh, and then she gave it to me. And I read it in like four days or something nonstop. And I remember I was in my dad's place and I would only go out of my room to eat. Yeah. And, and that's it. And sometimes I would like bring the food up and keep reading while I ate. And my dad was like, yeah, this is a completely normal behavior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which again, who cares? <laughs> yeah. I, don't know, I, I was that way too with the, the Potter books. And I feel like my parents whole thing was just like, they're like, at least it's a book, you know, <laughs> like he's reading like that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. Uh, and, uh, so your mom was like working and stuff. So were you guys like home alone after school and that uh, kind of thing? Nanny, nanny. Nanny. Okay. Very, uh, privileged Peruvian, uh, lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I always tell Europeans or Americans because it sounds, uh, shocking to them, but, uh, a salary for a nanny in Peru is like, used to be like 250 euros a month. And now maybe it's like 400, but still. Yeah. Uh, like it's, uh, it's, it, it wasn't uh, like, yeah. If, it, if you were like middle class, which is very small in Peru. So that's, that's the privilege side of it. Like the middle class is tiny. If you were middle class, you could probably afford either a nanny or a, like a, what do you call it? A, like a, a cleaning. A yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh. Yeah, that's it's the, the same way in California. Actually, it's like everybody, uh, well, not everybody, but like a lot of people in like you know middle class people have like a cleaning lady who comes a couple of days a week. Like my parents had this. Oh, no, also. No, yeah, my, in, 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 in Peru, in, in my case at least, it was like <laughs> like seven days a week all all day. So are you like how until how old were you? Was this uh, nanny coming? Because you must have been pretty close with her if you were spending yeah, yeah, so yeah. much time. Yeah, no, like always. Uh, when I when I was eighteen or something, uh, she was like no no longer a na nanny and just more focused on the house side of things. Yeah, but, but so yeah. there is like a like a, do you like and there then, must be like a relationship. Yeah, there, yeah, right? yeah, for sure, for sure. There's a there's a <laughs> some more elitist families that keep a, a distance. Yeah, they're like, mm. but uh, but in the, my family's case, we we like invite them over for like the ones that have worked more more time mm -hmm. there because there, it also happens that you hire someone and they fuck yeah. off after a, a six months or whatever. Of course. But the ones that work there for long, we like see them before Christmas or, or like see them. Yeah, like two, three times a year. My sister is uh, the godmother the baptism godmother of one of my nanny's ex nanny's children yeah. really yeah yeah super super oh, close cool. uh, like yeah um i mean that makes sense like i just think about like because that, that was a big part of my childhood was just like a lot of uh like 
just like different adults that were in my life who kind of like took care of me for my parents and stuff. And yeah. I still, I, to me they're like, I'm closer with them almost than that I am thing. with some of like our blood family or whatever, yeah, you for know? Sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I had many role models though, but yeah, I get, I get you. Like, like I have an uncle, for example, that, that he was like a role model in a lot of ways, like, because I saw him more often mm-hmm. than my, my dad a lot of the time. But yeah, I, I get it. Like you, you kind of latch on to whatever, yeah. whatever's there. Yeah. So what were you, what were you like into when you were a kid? Like besides anime, did you play sports? You were like into school, video games? Uh, I was very unathletic and I didn't, uh, I didn't know the meaning of working hard, I guess. So I, <laughs> I never, uh, I never. I mean, you worked hard at watching the anime yeah i mean 18 hour days that's commitment but yeah but i don't know is it work hard when you (laughs) love it is it hard work when you love it yeah um i was into school into like having good grades for a Mm -hmm. while um then i I was on the chess team for like a year and i did i really enjoyed chess for a while uh but this was when i was like 10 12 Mm -hmm. Then I did improv for like a year and a half when I was uh. 13. I really liked it. But again, all of my friends left and I kind of had a uh, uh, a disappointing result. So I was like, we had a, there was a tournament that, mm-hmm. that was getting organized because we did like uh, improv matches. So you had two teams and the team that contributed most to the story would, would win the match. Okay. There, it was like a, it's a weird improv format where you like, like it's a competition kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. But it's weird because the, the friendliest, and yeah. most positive, <laughs> like for example, if you're building a story and you only call people from your team to build a story, that's instant point deduction basically. Yeah. Like you have to be like, uh, Hey cousin, uh, come fast and look at someone from the other team. If you look at someone from your team, that's already like, considered like, uh, selfish yeah. or whatever but anyway okay. so there was this competition and we we done a workshop and uh i i felt like i was doing well enough to get picked uh, but i didn't get picked and the uh, the coach never told me why he basically told me yeah you're better than some of the people we picked but you're not mature enough or he didn't give me a clear reason yeah and then uh and then he didn't pick me and I was like super salty already. I was like, fuck, I'm good at this. Why yeah. Why not? You know, I, I'm not saying I was the best or anything, but I was good enough. Yeah, to get recognition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to also, this was like a competition that was going on in a theater with like 200 people capacity. And they were yeah. like, it was, it was a, a thing, you know? And I remember a, a bunch of friends of mine or people I knew got picked and I was salty as hell. Not because they got picked, but because I considered myself like, comparatively either better or at, at as good as a lot of them. And then with that, I was already kind of annoyed. And then all of my friends quit the, the, the team the next year. So I was like, okay, I have like, nobody recognizes me and the people I like to hang out with quit. So I quit. And that was, uh, now I, I'm like kind of sad about it. Yeah. But, but, uh, yeah. At the time, it's just what, what you've, what you want to do. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, like had you been in like like was there like improv type stuff like on tv or was like this the first time the yeah the big big comedy in peru is is a lot of it is improv based or related like we have a lot of clown Mm -hmm. like comedy those are the biggest shows i guess um and like for example my teacher the one that was running this competition was actually in a tv show at the time which of course doesn't pay as much when you're in peru like yeah tv show salary means you're one of the few comedians that can live off of comedy but uh but he was living off of comedy in peru which, which is, is a, a fuck it. that's the dream right that's the <laughs> like, dream yeah that's wherever the... you are if you can make it work living your dream that's... yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah i mean at the same time i probably wouldn't have moved to the us to the us to to europe and i wouldn't have started like doing stand-up in English and, like, pure stand-up, which is, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, who knows? Maybe it would have yeah. worked out anyway, but right now, like, I feel like the timing worked better in that, yeah. like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing stand-up in the format that I like the most. But, yeah, in, 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 like, improv can go into acting. A lot of people that I know from that competition are, like, actors now, like, on TV mm-hmm. or directors of, like, short films and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So there's, there's a... And so the improv stuff that's on TV, you like, 
Is it, you know, could you compare it to something like Saturday Night Live or... No, no, no. It's like, not sketch comedy, but it's it's more like... A, or like Whose Line Is It Anyways? Do you know that show? It's uh, it's not live improv. It, they, it's, don't, they don't yeah. like... They are people that know each other from in, improv mm -hmm. or like that, that from these clown workshops. But then they also write the, the stuff. Uh, okay. It's basically they take their characters that they've improv and workshopped and whatever. And they like bring it on on stage uh okay like and record it and stuff but it's it's that vibe like super silly humor in peru like there's a slapstick kind of yeah, like yeah. falling down and hurting yourself yeah yeah, or, yeah yeah like weird uh noises and like uh yeah silly animated effects or something it's super like so when you say clown humor like that's that's super interesting to me because right like i feel like uh now uh like in the states and stuff, there's there's like a like some real like anti clown uh, sentiment. Like everybody's like, ah, oh, they're creepy, whatever. Uh, but like, so a, like a Peruvian clown, is it like the same classic, like the red nose? Just the, the red nose, nothing else. Nothing. Okay. Just a, a regular street clothes and the nose. Really? Like, it's more like a Patch Adams. Type ah, of deal. okay. Like yeah. that type of clown, like not a. Not so just a, the nose to kind of like signify, hey, I'm silly. I th I, I think there's more to the clown philosophy, uh, but but yeah, like there, I think there's a deeper comical theory into it. Like I I don't really know it too well, so I don't want to misrepresent yeah. it. But it's like put on a, the red nose and do whatever it takes to make to get a laugh. It's like super mm. silly humor yeah. in that sense. And I get like I I. I the thing is, comedy has such a bigger history or larger like time in the U.S., so it's it's evolved and stuff. But that's kind of where comedy starts, right? Do anything to to get a laugh. And yeah, it, I mean, the first thing that I ever loved, like as a kid, there was this old. It must have been from like I don't know if it was from the twenties or like the thirties or forties, but it's like these like black and white uh videotapes of this group called the three stooges okay yeah yeah, yeah 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 and like i mean all of that shit is just like them like hitting each other in the head or like falling over shit and like that's like when if i think about like the the hardest i've ever laughed or like the first time i really thought some shit was funny like i loved that yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. so so pure and like silly and it's all just that like silly yeah. sounds when you hit each other and that, like that, that's where peru is at right now still like we have a, we have comedians that do like brown face basically a lot and like black face and stuff still, and it those are the most popular ones mostly and like so it's mostly like slapstick like three stooges mm -hmm. or this still kind of racist and even the one like but who are they making like so are they making fun of somebody with the like they're making like they're making racist jokes or like based off of stereotypes and even like there's a, a really good stand-up comedian in peru mm -hmm. uh, who who was on like tom segura's podcast or something like that oh uh, really yeah because tom segura's like half peruvian yeah well. yeah but uh even his character because he does a, he on his stand-up he doesn't do it as much but he has a character which is what made him go viral mm -hmm. which is just a stereotype of a racist white person because this guy is a white guy so he just goes super into like, oh, my God, if you're out of this district, which is the richest yeah. district in Lima, it's basically like saying if you're not in Prince Lauerberg, you're brown to me. Yeah. And he goes like super outrageous like that. And it's it's funny for Peruvians that like know that shit. But at the same time, it's just racist humor, you know? Yeah, it, it's like <laughs> it, when you compare it to the to the something that, for example, I think Anna told me mm -hmm. uh, recently was like. Just as a comment, right? The the idea that stand-up has evolved so much and taste has evolved so much that it's it takes a genius to pull pull off like one-liners or or something like that in the in the current English stand-up scene. Mm -hmm. People want more. People want like depth. People want your personality. People want stories. Something mm. like if 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 you did like a, a I do only plays on racial stereotypes in the U.S. You're you, not gonna get very far unless you're a genius. Yeah. Unless you just take a, take it to a whole new level, you're not gonna get anywhere. You know. And that, the the thing is in Peru, that's still the the norm. And there's again, there's people like underground people that are trying to 
to evolve it. Like this guy that I told you that has the the white, uh, the white dumb guy stereotype. He does do other good stuff, but in reality, the sad reality is what gets you on TV, what gets you big, is usually like is the the stuff that's a bit more base or you know basic racist yeah yeah Jer even some jerry seinfeld type of stuff like yeah. uh, look at this thing it's yeah. so funny <laughs> like it's just yeah that's the reality so when you were uh like a you know like whatever 10 years old 15 years old whatever was there stand up that was like on tv or like no. in the culture at all no, no, I watched so, like when like I guess the question I want to ask is like when what do you think is like the first thing that like came into your life that was like comedy? And then when did you first kind of discover stand up? OK, so comedy in general, I would say like these like barbershop type movies like uh, like barbershop, right? But with mm -hmm. Ice Cube, but like comedy movies. Yeah, yeah. Comedy movies I loved always. Like um, I don't know if and were you watching them like in English with in English uh, in English with Spanish subtitles when I was really young, uh, and then in English with English subtitles when I was like twelve or something. Like so, you were learning English from like a young yeah age. yeah. I like I I learned it a lot because of the media. Like mm -hmm. I remember I I never studied English a day in my life. Like because I always knew it, kind of. I didn't always know it, but I forced myself to learn it because I liked comedy so much. Mm -hmm. I, I had this uh, moment that I, I still remember where I like invited some friends over to watch a movie, like a comedy movie, and, uh, and we were watching it, and I was like, oh, there's only a, a subtitles version, like, uh, because you bought, bought, we bought the movie, and, yeah. the, and uh, there's only subtitled version. Fuck it, let's watch it that way. Uh, and I realized like 30 minutes in that my friends had left because they couldn't get it, you know? Ah, uh, yeah. Because it, it's hard to watch a movie with subtitles, especially when you're like eight years old. Seven yeah, years, totally. Yeah. And I was like way into the movie, so I didn't notice. But yeah, I I think I learned a lot that way, English. And uh, yeah, I started off with the that, that type of movie, you know, like yeah, silly like humor. Like Chris Tucker and yeah. Uh, yeah. Rush Hour. Rush with, Hour. Oh. Can, have you watched Kangaroo Jack? Kangaroo Jack. Yes, yeah. That's a fucking classic. Uh, yeah. I love that movie. That, like, now, if I watched those movies, I wouldn't find them as funny, but that was kind of my intro. And then SNL. Like, yeah. I was religious about I, SNL. I, I just didn't cut it. But doesn't that, like, sometimes that makes me a little bit sad. Like, I think about, like, how much joy, like, like also, like, cer certain, um, like, Eddie Murphy movie. Like, I loved Eddie Murphy when I was a kid. And, like, I've gone back and tried to rewatch some of those, like, movies. Like, uh, there was this one, like, Pluto, Pluto Nash or something. I remember loving it as a kid. And now it's, like, kind of hard to watch. Yeah, <laughs> And it, it kind of makes me sad. I'm, like, I miss the place where it was just, like, so joyful to fucking watch, like, Chris Tucker like yelling at Jackie Chan. Like. You have to get it. You have to either smoke a joint or get into that mindset. And yeah. I, like because I I get you. I tried to watch uh, Don't Mess with the Sohan recently. Oh yeah. And I was laughing, but I was laughing every five jokes. You know? Yeah. The other ones was like uh, I get it. Like I get the yeah. joke. I get, but before I remember watch and that's like newish I guess not yeah. that old. But remember when I watched it I died. You know, I died when they were like doing the disco disco or yeah. like, or they were putting hummus on everything. Or, I was loving it. And, uh, but now I'm like, this is kind of racist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which it is. Yeah. But again, if you get into that mindset of this is like, uh, just enjoy the silly, I, I think you can do it. But, but yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of. It's sad and it's not, I guess, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean, it's, I guess, taste change, your taste, you change, and so it, your taste changes and... You're less ignorant, you know, you're less, like, it's like saying, I'm sad that I know nutrition because I can't eat McDonald's without <laughs> feeling guilty, you know what I'm saying? Like, when you know that there's, like, this, like, amazing level of comedy that will touch a hundred buttons, of course you don't enjoy the one that's funny when it touches two, you know? So, yeah. I don't know. I like. I agree that it's sad, but at the same time, it's like it's sad because now you know there's better stuff out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. True. But I mean, I feel like what I notice happens to me more and more as I get older, and also I feel like 
but some of it is also getting more like like I got more into comedy and so then I get like you get more critical of it or whatever but I find myself being more and more like oh that's funny you know like you're like oh wow that's really funny you know and not like oh like you know like actually laughing and like I know I I tried to be like (laughs) I I don't remember where I read it or who said it but I heard some somebody say like an experienced comedian say something like you have to be the best audience member every time you go and uh and so I really try to every time I'm watching someone like even in an open mic I try to to laugh as much as I can because also instead of being like that's funny like let yourself enjoy it first of all it helps get the crowd going a lot if there's yeah if it, like it it makes other people feel comfortable with laughing if mm-hmm. if there's already two three people in the crowd that are laughing super loud and it also like gets you to work that whole actually enjoy the shit yeah well i will say actually i feel like live comedy is like the is the exception for me is it's okay. like i feel like i'm easier to laugh when i'm seeing like people perform and even and also sometimes the times that i laugh the hardest actually are shit that like nobody's laughing at yeah, you know yeah, and you're yeah. like fuck that's so good like and yeah, nobody's yeah. appreciating it which almost makes it funnier yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and as a, like as being on stage it's like i feel like sometimes all you need is like that one, one like to hear that one person laughing and be like ah, okay yeah. somebody somebody's yeah. fucked up like me or somebody yeah, like yeah. It, it needs work <laughs> but it's 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 in a good direction yeah yeah, yeah yeah he got the idea yeah uh no, yeah, I get you. Sometimes it's also the pressure of why is this guy on Netflix? You know, like yeah, you you you're like also judging a little when you're watching a special because it's like okay, this guy has his own hour. It's on Netflix. Is it actually funny? So you have to be like, yeah, this is funny. yeah, that is funny. Yeah, and and I think there is so much of that that like has to do with like like now if uh like if a comedian that I really like is like putting out a special, I always try to make like get at least one person to watch it with me. Cause it's like, even if you're watching something with two people, you're more likely to like yeah, laugh enjoy and enjoy it. than if you're just watching it by yourself, like sitting at your desk. Yeah. 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 I get it for sure. I get it. Like last time I watched uh, a special with someone, I was, I remember like crying, laughing and, uh, and, I, that rarely happens when I'm alone. Like, yeah, it happens, but it rarely happens compared to yeah. Yeah. Uh. Well. Okay. So I kind of interrupted you. So you you got into like these you know these movies, Barber Shop, uh, Rush Hour. Then you got into like SNL. Yeah, SNL was like religious for me for a while. Like I I I was and like what era of SNL was that? L- late. Late, I think late. Like, like who? Like who were some of the your favorite yeah, yeah. Uh, cast members? My favorite cast member to this day is still uh, Andy Samberg. Oh yeah, I he's fucking, really good. His digital shorts were like yeah. just masterful. Like I, I really love, and the the silly like shit that he did was like, great. Then I had I loved Keenan Thompson. Oh, I mean, yeah, I guess yeah. he, he's done it for like now twenty years or something. So it's kind yeah. of ridiculous. Um. I, I got into it, for example, when, uh, what's his name? Uh, he now has his own, po- uh, his own, uh, his own show, but he used to be Seth Meyers. Ah, oh, right. He yeah. used to be on, on uh, Weekend, Weekend Update. Update. Yeah. I didn't really like him on Weekend Update as much, but I, I thought he was a funny dude. But that was also, I think, the era then, like, when, um, like, Bill Hader would come and oh, do yeah. the, uh, I can't remember the character. Stefan. Stefan. Oh, my God. Stefan uh, was my favorite character, yeah, for sure. That was so funny. And then also Kristen Wiig was on, I think, in that era, too. Yeah, but I, I didn't connect with her so much. Ah, uh, okay. So. Have you seen uh, uh, Kenan Thompson do uh, Big Papi David, David Ortiz? No. He does, like, this impression of, like, a Puerto Rican <laughs> um, a baseball player. I, yeah. I'm cracking up just thinking about it. He goes on Weekend Update, and they're, like, asking him about some baseball shit. And then he just starts talking about food. <laughs> like... Uh, <laughs> 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 a big puppy had a big lunch you know? <laughs> just like doing some dumb sh- and and it's like one of those jokes that 
that it gets funnier with repetition, you know? Yeah. First is like, oh, it's silly because he's a fat guy and he's only thinking about lunch, you know? <laughs> They ask him like, what does it feel like to play in a Met Stadium again? And like after so long, I don't know about baseball, yeah. but whatever. And then he goes, it's great because in Met Ma <laughs> Stadium, they give you big lunch, you know? <laughs> and that's, that's like already, but then like it's... <laughs> It, it just keeps going back to the fucking lunch. <laughs> yeah. And the more he does it, and then he lists off like uh, weird foods yeah. in Spanish that don't, don't make sense in Spanish. Like I speak Spanish yeah. and they barely, <laughs> they barely like make sense. Like, uh, fucking, I don't know. Like, yeah. mo, mo. like yeah. it just goes like, quesadilla con frita tatita or something <laughs> like that like and and he just keeps listing food and it it builds up and like i actually recently found a compilation of, of all the 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 skits yeah and i was like at first i was like why why was this funny okay okay a little and by the end i watched it was like two 10 minute compilations <laughs> by the end of the the second 10 minute compilation i was like crying in bed yeah. every <laughs> every time the guy was opening his mouth i was like <laughs> just gasping for air yeah that's one of the best like things in comedy i think is that like uh this um like taking a joke just like past the point of uh you know that where it's like people get sick of it and then it almost like comes all the way back around and then they get so sick of it that it's like yeah. absurd and yeah it's it's just mad and and you like you're expecting it yeah but there's a small part of you that's like maybe this time it won't happen yeah maybe <laughs> and when it happens again you're like no it happened yeah. again <laughs> yeah it's amazing and actually i don't remember exactly when i started watching stand-up i think it just kind of happened naturally like as a as a but did you start like just like watching clips on youtube kind of thing or uh was it clips clips on youtube and uh, i really got into it deep with netflix like uh, yeah when i was like 19 or something i guess like i i watched like clips do you remember the first special you watched on netflix mm. I, w I think it was Delirious by Eddie Murphy. I, I probably uh, watched it before, mm -hmm. but I watched it, like, with more appreciation of, of the art. Yeah. Like, when when I was, yeah, like, 19 or something, and I watched Delirious, and I was like, this is... Yeah. This is, like... And I still... Like, right now that I'm trying to find the style or whatever, that's one of the ones I gravitate towards the most. Like, Chris Rock, mm -hmm. Eddie Murphy... Uh, Cat Williams is not that much in that vein, yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, those those types of like, yeah, I'm a comedian, but I'm still like, I'm a, I'm also a rock star type, yeah. of, type of vibe. I I really like that. Uh, like, I like self deprecating humor and being silly. Like Andy Samberg is just yeah. a dumb motherfucker, and I love that. But but there's something about that whole like rock star vibe. Like fucking Eddie Murphy when he got on stage, it was like. Yeah, it was another level. And what's the expression? Like, all the guys want to be him and all the girls want to be with him. Be with, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. Th that's Eddie Murphy and that's uh, Chris Rock and that's, like, all yeah. of it. And it, it really, like, I don't know. I, it, it adds some power. And I don't know. Like, like, now Tom Segura is not that much on that vein, but I still feel like... But I think what, Tom, what they all have, and I think that someone like Tom Segura also has, uh, is it's, like, that, like don't give a fuck energy. You know what I mean? Like they're saying what they're going to say and they don't get like, they don't give a shit. Like it's not like, oop, oop, did I cross, you know? Yeah. There's like a confidence exactly, there. Exactly. Or self-assuredness. That, that's the thing. Like I think more than don't give a fuck, it's like, I know. Like I already know this is my thing. Like because yeah. don't give a fuck is more like a, an Eminem type of thing. Like I, I, I can go crazy and I know what I'm saying is wrong, but it, I'm, I still like to say it, but with them, it's more like I'm right. Yeah. I'm, I'm so confident about it. I make you second guess the fact you're going to be offended, but then you're going to see my point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that I find, I don't know, amazing, but yeah. yeah. So, so you so like get, get, start watching some, uh, like specials on Netflix and stuff. And so, How, at, at what point did you think to yourself, like, oh, I want to, like, maybe think about doing this? Like, did you think about that at all while you were in Peru or did you start over here? So, yeah. So, I, bef like, I wanted to leave Peru 
like subconsciously for a long time. Mm-hmm. But when I went on exchange during my bachelor's, I went to Portugal and, and I loved it. And I was like, okay, I'm leaving. Yeah. And so then right before the pandemic, like in, in, in January and stuff, I was like applying to master's here. Mm-hmm. I had just graduated my bachelor's uh, and I was working full time uh, as a consultant. <laughs> Kill me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was like applying to master's. Mm-hmm. And then I read this book called The, the War of Art. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's not like, yeah like, I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. It's fucking amazing. I, I recommended it to Moni in his pod, her podcast. Uh-huh. And she, she told me recently, I already read it like three times. <laughs> I was like, okay, she liked it. But yeah, it was crazy. And I realized that I wanted to do something that I loved. And I was mm-hmm. like, what do I love? And I was like, comedy. Mm-hmm. And by that point, I, I was really like into Joe Rogan. And I had gotten more into stand-up. Are you sure you want to admit that on the podcast? Oh my god! Any comedian that hates <laughs> Joe Rogan, fucking at me on Instagram, and I'll fight you. Like I'll fist fight you, motherfuckers. I still don't understand why everyone hates him. I assume it's because he's famous. But anyway, <laughs> let's not get into it. Uh, so yeah, like I got into Joe Rogan because I, I was doing Muay Thai, and and he had like mm. he knows a lot about martial arts, and he like commentates on it and stuff. So I I. Uh, I got got into Joe Rogan and I ended up like liking the dude and watching more of his like comedy content. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, at that point, like that was like 20, like, yeah, start of the pandemic. So like two and a half years ago or something. Yeah. And I really got into like watching a lot of comedy. Then I was watching like Burt Kreischer, Tom yeah. Segura, basically everyone Joe Rogan had on like Nicky Glaser. Yeah. I, I always loved Chappelle, but I was getting into watching him more actively because Joe Rogan always said, this yeah, is, this guy's the goat. And I, like, then I realized everyone says it. Yeah. But like when, like when I remember like Joe Rogan saying like, yeah, Dave Chappelle, the best in history. And I was like, I know this guy, is he really the best? And then I re- I was like, yeah, he is like, damn. But, uh, I don't know. I started like really getting into comedy, uh, like stand up uh, specifically. And then when I read the book and the book is basically saying, do with your life, whatever you're like so passionate about, you really want to do. I was like, it's it's always been comedy, kind of like barbershop movies, SNL. After, later on, getting into stand up, it was always comedy. And I'm actually well, even like the improv thing. Also, improv, it's like yeah. it, that's. That I mean, it's not always exactly comedic, but it's yeah. And I did mostly comedic and performance, yeah. and yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it like it was kind of how I communicated because I was like a very awkward teen and mm. au- very like just yeah. Every every <laughs> comedian I know, every comedian says <laughs> right there I, with you, buddy. <laughs> but I really like I was terrible, like terrible. At, I, I I still am. Like I have like some brain farts where people are like, Bruno, I thought you were like. A sociable person i was like no 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 i learned this recently yeah <laughs> <laughs> but like i i i communicated i made friends i i hit on girls by being funny mm-hmm. like that was my my thing so so i was like damn this is this is it and uh like now that i'm doing stand-up i'm like okay stand-up but i still don't know like where it might lead like i would love to be on snl for example i would that's like one of the dreams where I, I'm, it's not my goal, especially now after realizing how terrible the work environment <laughs> yeah. is there. But but like I might like draft. But, but to do something like that, like to try to make like sketches and yeah, to yeah, do yeah. like improv and, you know, this yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. thing. Yeah. Improv, I wouldn't like to, to keep it as a as a like I, I would like to re- return to it at some point to use it for my stand up. Mm-hmm. But I definitely prefer stuff where I can like build an act. Yeah, there's there's a weird improv that I don't know how it works in uh, well because it's not the one we did in Peru. But in the U.S., they have a lot of improv where you use returning characters a lot and you really build up a character. Maybe that would be interesting for me. Yeah, but the improv that I did was like pure from scratch, and you could like you could develop tools. Like now I do a good Russian accent or whatever. But you couldn't like it would be weird if you were using a returning character. Yeah. So in I don't know I don't like the whole. It it was funny when it happened, and we like again, th- these people doing improv in Peru are filling up theaters of two hundred people like regularly. Wow. But, uh, I don't know. I like the idea of actually building up to something. You know. Yeah. And, 
Do you like uh, or do you prefer performing in English or could you picture yourself uh, like performing in Spanish if there were like opportunities like that? Or could you picture yourself performing like back in Peru uh, at some point? I've, I've actually like thought about it a lot uh, because I'm going back for Christmas and I, uh-huh. I would tr- I like to try to get a spot. Um, firstly, I would like to f- perform in Spanish here. Yeah, for expats, uh, because I think they're more like used to, to to like more social commentary jokes or more like a, a the style of stand up and the style I'm, of humor that exactly is, yeah like right now if I do Spanish a, a stand up in Spanish here I can basically translate a lot of jokes yeah and and fix the timing but translate a lot of yeah. jokes if I do stand up in Peru. I probably I have to write a new set. Like I have to write a new set for sure. And <laughs> they're not gonna love all the material about you Peru. being <laughs> suffering coming over to Berlin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would not <laughs> dig that shit. They would not dig that shit. No, no, no. Um, or for example, the 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 jokes that I have about being a feminist because my sister hits me or something like that. They there would be like three people in the crowd yelling out "fag" or something like that. <laughs> like. Uh, but I I haven't actually seen stand up in 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 Peru like live. Maybe I'm underestimating the crowds there. Yeah, but that's that's kind of how I imagine it a little bit. But do you is there an open mic like if you were in Lima, is there an open mic scene or is it only just like fully produced shows? No, I think there are open mics. I just never heard about them. Like, yeah, I I think if I do the research, I can probably you, do this like yeah. post. I, I, and I'm gonna do it like when it's closer, like November. Yeah, late. Actually, it's already late November, so probably early December. I'll start like <laughs> like January. Yeah, I'm definitely. <laughs> <laughs> After I return, yeah. I'll start <laughs> posting. Yeah, so I'll probably like try to get a spot and see what happens. But uh, I, I would like to develop most of my career in English and then do some appearances in Spanish where I'm when when and if I get to 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 maintain my style even after I translate mm-hmm. you know I don't want to have to go through the ranks over there you know like if I if I like if I do shows in Peru I would like it to be more like oh Bruno is coming back you know there's the yeah. guy who's making it in where, wherever and he's coming back and he's going to do his own style, but in Peru. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to create a style that would be successful in Peru because I, that's not really my thing. You know, yeah. like by the time I'm back there, I w- would have liked to already find my crowd. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like people buy my tickets are expecting to, to hear about me making fun of my own privilege in, in that way that I yeah. do in English, you know? So I don't know. I The thing is, I never... I I don't like living in Peru, so I'm I'm like fairly certain that I don't. Yeah. So when that's the other thing I wanted to ask you about is like so when you came over for this like study abroad was like had you spent much time outside of Peru before you did that? I travel a lot. I have uh, step siblings from the U.S. Actually, ah, okay. So I had visited the Matan and just culturally, you know, like there's a you always did you always kind of feel a sense of like. Oh, I want to leave or go yeah, somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, always, always, and and uh, only later in life did I like validate it, and did I was like, okay, it, it, this does make sense, and I understood where it came from, but like I always had it. I always was like, okay, this is like I'm a bit I'm progressive, right? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm like a, a guy that's like you're feminist. I am. I actually am, you know, not by the fucking weird uh, definitions that we have nowadays. But I remember getting into a ton of trouble for like treating girls the same. Yeah. Like I remember a girl. This is a very distinct memory that I have. A girl like I, we were like in gym class and, and I was like throwing the basketball to the hoop or whatever. Yeah. And I missed and a girl took the ball and then she, she was like, oh, go, go get another one. And I was like, no, this is my ball. And she was like, no, go get another one. Like, just f- like, fuck you, basically. Yeah. And we're like 11 or something. And I just like, uh, like uh, slapped it out of her hands and took it. And I was like, this is my ball. Go get yours. Don't be yeah. like, conceited. <laughs> and then she started crying and telling everyone I hit her. And uh, and my, the, the teacher like gave me like a, a not detention, but, the, but the, like some sort of a uh, warning penalty yeah. or warning. Yeah. And I was like. What the fuck? You yeah. know, this is, I, if I had done this with a guy, nobody would have like automatically believed the guy or anything. It's just like 
I was raised mostly with my mom, my sister, and the nanny. So it was all women in my house. My sister was beating me up, so I never had this weird notion that women were less than equal yeah. or couldn't handle their shit. Exactly. Or, yeah. like, I had a like a, a woman telling me I was nothing for <laughs> so much of my life. So I was like, if if I'm nothing, I'm probably less than yeah, women. Yeah. Yeah. So I like. Eventually, I found out that's bullshit, right? Yeah. <laughs> like eventually, I b became a person. But you know, like I never had this this uh, like I I have unlearned a lot of things reading about feminism or whatever. But mostly, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, I like yeah. for most of the things, and I don't know. Per it, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, progressive also and more like drug culture and stuff like that and, and economic culture. In Peru, you have like really like free market freaks, like libertarians. Yeah. Like, uh, or you have uh, ultra communist left wing. So both of them, those sides I find like dumb as shit. Yeah. And, uh, and for, uh, it's even more funny that they're both just excuses for corruption. Yeah. Like, just I mean, different ways to swindle people out of their money exactly. and like, take tax dollars. <laughs> That's why I, what I tell everyone. Like, I don't know why you're fighting so much. Just pick the guy who le looks the least like a robber, you know? Like, yeah. Like, who you... Because they're all, like, doing the same shit. But anyway, like, I just... I'd never felt there. Like, in Peru, you, you smoke weed, and for a lot of people, it's like, oh, he's taking drugs. Yeah. You know? and they make such a big deal out of it. And I don't know. I didn't. I didn't fit in with a lot of groups. And with the ones that I did, I, it felt like a small percentage of the population. So I was like, fuck it. I want to go to a place where I can be more openly, like, yeah. do my thing, you know? Yeah, and be yourself. And so uh, so then you you do this, like, study abroad and you that kind of cements in your mind, like, oh, I want to, like, move permanently. And uh, was that, like, a hard transition at all or... It was hard when I was still in Peru and trying to make the move because I had like experienced for the first time in my life what it was like to live alone without my parents, mm. to to live in a like a super progressive place, to like just have all of these things, uh, this nicer lifestyle in my opinion. And when I went back to Peru, it fucking sucked. Like uh, I I suffered a lot. I suffered. That's fucking dramatic. I I disliked but everybody. It. Uh, like, but yeah, I mean, suffering I is is like. Relative, relative, but yeah. it's still like when you're suffering, it's still suffering. Yeah, yeah, it, fuck, it sucked. It sucked so bad, and I was having the time of my life in Portugal. So, so it, to come back, it was like a that was a culture shock. Yeah, 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 that was horrible. When I was in Portugal, as soon as I arrived, I was like, damn, I'm home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it for a while I was like, and it was like two years from when I moved back t back to when I left again. Mm -hmm. So I like. Even more, like, yeah, two, two and a half. So, like, for the first six months-ish, I was like, I hate this. And then I was like, okay, Bruno, just focus on how to get back. And then, yeah, I, as soon as I graduated, I was like, okay, the way to get back. First, I thought it was just applying for jobs. Then I realized that for full-time jobs in business, you need usually a master's degree in Europe. Uh. So I applied for the master's. Then I did I did the first half of the mar master's while wanting to do stand-up. Mm -hmm. And then I started stand up here in Berlin. So yeah, now uh, I'm, so are you doing your masters now, or you're working? So or? yeah, I'm, I'm like the thing. It's a the masters requires an internship, uh, and okay. it was like minimum three months or something. And I decided let's make it long. I can save up some money as well, and uh, so now I'm gonna work for. So I took a semester off of the masters. Uh huh. Uh, I'm gonna work here in Berlin till March. Then I'm going on exchange to Cologne for. For uh, one semester, but more like three three months. Uh, okay. And then I just have my thesis left, which uh, okay. hopefully I'll write here in Berlin so I can do stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, how far is Cologne from Berlin? Uh, That's a, such an ignorant question. It's, yeah, I'm like, it's, I've been living here for two years, and I'm like, like, how far away is Cologne? I know it's a little bit of ways away. It's it's like. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's ours. It's like yeah. I, I guess. So you could come back me. here and there, but it wouldn't be like you could come back on no, weekends. I'm or gonna something. open a mic there. Mm -hmm. If if there are not enough mics in English and there are not, I kind of already know. Then I'm gonna open yeah. up my my own mic over there for sure. But I'm also gonna have to get used to the fact that I'm gonna perform like twice a week. Yeah. At best. 
Well, I mean, then maybe there's like an opportunity to do something with like doing sketches or, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah, um, I think so. What, so does your sister still live in Argentina or did she end up moving back to Peru? She or? moved back to Peru and now she recently moved to Holland. To the ah, okay. Yeah. So she uh, and like, so that's what I wanted to ask about is like, like, cause I think like my parents would never say like, oh, Patrick, like don't live in Germany. Like they are happy for me. They support me. That's their, that's their thing. But like, I can also tell it's hard for them sometimes you know, like, uh, the time difference, trying to be able to talk to them. Is it like, does your mom, is that hard for her that you're like all the way over here? Does she say like, Oh, I wish you would come back or anything like that. It's hard for her, but she would never say, I, I wish you'd come back because she knows that I'm happier here. So, and she's mm. like cheesy like that. I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she's like one of these weird moms who like wants her kids to be happy. It's like <laughs> yeah. super wild. <laughs> one of those, one of those crazy. Yeah. But, uh, no, she's she's happy for me and and she knows she it's hard for her and she kind of let, lets me know but yeah but she's happy for me. My dad, he's a bit more uh, harder to read with his emotions, mm. I guess, like most dads. But he I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> hey, <laughs> guys, did you know Patrick had two lesbian <laughs> yeah. moms? Crazy. Okay. So yeah, he like I remember when I I told him I was going to do the masters and stuff. First, he did a couple of attempts to, to convince me that it was better for my future to stay in Peru. Uh -huh. And uh, then he was like, I actually always knew that you would leave. And that was his, his way of saying, like, yeah, giving me his blessing. And now the, the political situation is so bad in Peru that my dad is thinking of moving to Spain. Uh, really? So it kind of worked out in the end. What's, uh, what's happening in Peru that it's got like that it would make your dad want to move? Or like, what's changed, I guess? So we got a, a, a openly communist Marxist president. He was elected mm -hmm. and he has like 40% of Congress, which is a lot in, in, a, in a democracy with several parties. Yeah. Because you guys have two, so 40% sounds, oh, minority. No, yeah. in, in our case, it's like... That's a big majority, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he just needs one or two parties to ally with him and he's, he has it. But yeah, he's president and he's like openly like quoting Marx and Stalin and he hinted at dictatorship many times. Like he's uh, like a lot of his party is from remnants of an ex-terrorist organization that we had in the 90s. Uh, okay. So it's a uh, it's a uh, people are scared and he's already like doing dumb shit. Yeah. Uh, like that to fuck up the economy. He was like he came. Like, oh, sorry. Go he ahead. came into office in July. So it's not a. Uh, crazy yet but uh like the, the our our currency has devalued like crazy so my parents are just thinking and they're really close to retirement age mm. so they're just thinking i don't want to like have lose everything or get a, a crazy tax that fucks me up or they're not a uh, uh, above just taking people's shit like yeah that, that's what i was gonna ask is like some of his policy like basically like oh we're gonna like nationalize some of these businesses yeah. and yeah, this kind of that's uh that's what he's hinting at so that's yeah. why they're like yeah we're leaving. that's why people are nervous and yeah yeah and i mean it's kind of what i expected like when i left peru one of the reasons why was like there's two options for me either i fix the country or i leave the country and I was like, I'm not fixing it. Like, I'm not uh, smart enough, good enough, <laughs> dedicated enough. And there's not enough people around me. And I just was like, okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs> and it ended up happening, happening a bit sooner than I expected. But yeah, it's uh, imploding in its own way. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. It's always interesting to me, like, because like, I've never been to Peru, but I've always, like, uh, it's always been like a country that I wanted to visit just because like, I, like, I love like natural beauty and like, like I'm not a big cities uh, person necessarily, but like, you know, like mountains and that yeah, kind yeah. of shit. And so it's like Peru seems super uh, amazing that way. But it's always also interesting to me to be like, when you talk to someone from a, like a country that you haven't been to, and then you realize like, Oh, there's like a whole world of like culture and politics and it's like all happening and you're totally yeah, uh, unaware, of that. unaware of it. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so to, to, we, we should probably, we've been already like talking for an hour. So, okay. 
at you know the end of the podcast. Let's we, make it on a lighter note. Let's we can <laughs> not talk about politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, so you chose uh, Tom Segura's special ball hog, and I forgot my notes over here. So look at your camera and say something to people while I grab my notes. Uh, Patrick is running and he's being weird. <laughs> Here we are. All right. He's back. I took notes because I'm, you know. He's a nerd. I'm, I'm a, I'm a nerd. He's an academic. Yeah. Uh, but so what, what made you besides uh, Tom Segura having a Peruvian connection? Is there like a reason why you chose him or Ball Hog specifically? The, the confidence, the like the guy, the guy goes into the edgier topics, but like. In, into topics that he's like making fun of you like it it's basically like bully topics at mm -hmm. some points but he makes you laugh so i just found that so challenging and so compelling every time that i saw it because in in uh, in comedy one of the rules ish that they tell you is don't don't put, think of yourself above the audience or tr treat the audience of, as if they're below you and tom segura doesn't like do that doesn't treat you like a piece of shit But he does, like, it openly states when he thinks he's right and somebody else is wrong. Yeah. With a confident, like, ball hog, the, 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 the spoiler alert, I guess. The, the, <laughs> the name is because of a bit where he's, like, describing how your mom is getting 69 and balls are yeah. hitting her in the face. Yeah. And, like, the, the premise is, like, what if 69 was being done, like, reverse, right? Yeah. And... He's describing your dad's balls hitting your mom in the face. Yeah. <laughs> and while he's doing that, which is supposed to be, if not offensive, at least disgusting, you're dying. You're yeah. Like every person I've showed the special, that I've showed it to like three or four people. They're, they're all crying at that point. Like people that you would think are like prudish even, they're still laughing because he just, I don't know. He, Like in a lot of ways, it's admiration for the craft, I guess. That yeah, that special. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I was gonna say is like when I was watching that uh, bit, is like also I thought what what was interesting to rewatch it with like the eye of like okay, how is he making this work? Especially as someone who like also aspires to like talk about subjects that are a little bit taboo, and then like you know come at them from kind of the inappropriate way. And then bring the joke around to like your real opinion about it. That's maybe more in line with uh, what what's like socially acceptable. But what I was appreciating when he was doing that bit is it's like he's doing all these like great like facial expressions and pauses. So it's like he's saying something terrible, and then he's looking <laughs> horrified at what yeah. he just said, and it kind of like gives the audience or you like like ah okay like he's. He's he going knows. somewhere with this. And he knows that what he's saying is horrible. As well, yes, right? yeah. Like, the, the, the acknowledgement is is there. Uh, yeah, I, I, fuck, I, it's, he's, he's a genius, and that's that you can tell. And also, I think he's himself. And I, I say this about, about every stand-up that I like, but you can tell that he's in his element throughout the whole special. Mm. And sometimes it requires more or less skill to be in your element. But he is fully like if I say I'm a feminist and I make a, a bit about how guys are dumb or, or sexism is dumb, that's you don't need to be a great comic to get a clap from that. Yeah. But that's not like not every side of you is supposed to be popular. Like it's yeah. supposed to be socially acceptable. And I think he goes out of his way to show the sides that are not socially acceptable but still make you empathize with him, you know? Yeah, yeah. And no, that's a, that's a really uh, uh, a good point. Like, he had, uh, like, a really funny bit where he's talking about, like, in that special where he's talking about, like, all the people he offended in his last uh, special, and he's talking about, like, the gypsies. Uh, and he was like, oh, we prefer, like, G-word. And then he, like, does this whole, like, really, like, W like well done bit where he's like talking about like you know the c word and the n word like in all this uh thing and it's it's just like it, it it's like just a quick little line really but it like so kind of uh perfectly summarizes the silliness of the fact that like 
we won't say the words, but we're happy to say the like replacement word of, yeah. you know, like, oh, like it's a G word or a C word, you know, like, yeah. 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 Uh, and, and, and it's like saying what's up my n words yeah, yeah. you're yeah. still implying that you yeah. wanted to say that like, exactly <laughs> you're saying it yeah you know? in all practicality you're saying it and, and but that's the thing that's hard i feel like as like you know like as aspiring comedians you're like it's like you want to like reach for that but i mean that's like the skill set of walking that line where he maintain where it's like it's funny and he maintain maintains like likability and stuff that's what's fascinating to me yeah. kind of yeah I, I i i agree and i think i'm trying to do that with a lot of my jokes right now and i think it's hard but it's impossible if you don't try like it's it's uh like i have this bit a, a lot of my bits are like being fake cocky right but i have this one about how i look like enrique iglesias yeah. and, <laughs> and it's happened to me like f four or five times that it just completely bombs in a horrible way because people believe me like <laughs> believe i'm so arrogant and so so much of an asshole to to say i'm super handsome and i'm yeah. which yeah like i know like i'm, I'm kidding it's a comedy show yeah right? <laughs> but uh but I also think that it's kind of a, a thing you ha you have to put yourself out there and make like fuck up to see how it is that you make it land, you know, mm -hmm. like because you don't want to like the the expressions. That's actually amazing observation about how uh, uh, Tom Segura does it, because he's kind of like implying in the middle of it. Hey, remember, this is a joke. Like, yeah, hey, remember, but without cutting the vibe. Right. Because you don't want to be like. By the way, I'm kidding. And then yeah. continue with your joke, right? So I think it's the kind of thing, like, skill-wise, if you get used to doing super easy jokes and, like, uh, I'm a feminist. Uh, oh, my God, the racism is bad. Uh, old people that are racist are, like, uh, yeah. compute Windows 97 or some like, like, if you don't get go for the challenging stuff, you're never going to, like, learn the tools that you need to yeah to 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 do it and i i mean i don't know them right yeah <laughs> <laughs> not at all i fucking suck <laughs> but, but but it is it's like it, that's i think that's what's interesting as you do like more mics and stuff and then when you like for me doing this exercise of like okay let me watch back some of these uh specials or whatever for the podcast is it's like i feel like at first, like the first part of me, like getting into doing mics and stuff is just like, fuck, I got to figure out some shit to write and I got to figure out like, uh, it, you know, some punchlines and it's got it's got to be funny. And then like now I feel like I'm starting to get to a point where I'm like, oh, like it's also about like, you know, you your pause needs to be funny and the yeah. face that you make when you pause needs to be, you know what I mean? There's like. There's so many layers. I mean, the writing is always important, but also then like the performative aspect yeah, is uh, can change a whole bit. It's a you're you're a performer. Like that's uh, it's a super short sentence, but I, uh, Liliana mm -hmm. uh, Velasquez, like me, yeah. she said it, uh, and I think it's it's that is a complete job. A performer is how you dress has to transmit something. How you are even before the set when people are looking at you, those people are going to be in the crowd. All of that is part of the performance. And of course, right now, we, we don't even have a third of it mastered, like a third of the aspects, but everything. Like Tom Segura, for example, he doesn't write his bits, which I think is fucking insane. Yeah. But he says, and he said it in a bunch it, of... Like, you mean this, like, writing on stage idea? Yeah, yeah. He, he, that's the thing. That's what I was going to get to. Like, he doesn't write down his bits... But he knows everything about them. He's not freestyling. He's not getting to the same point in different ways. He knows every pause, every face, every step that he takes before he does a special. Like all of the greats, right? Like yeah. Louis said the same thing. But like, again, when you want to do land a challenging joke, you have to like be like, yeah, the pause that I make, the when you are going to say something offensive, for example, something I noticed that Chris Rock does a lot, when you're going to say something mean, you have to smile a lot just yeah. to make it known that you're not a dick, you know? Yeah. And I, I guess that's, it, that, that's more of an approach thing. That's what Chris Rock does. 
But what Tom Segura does is like, like when he's saying something ridiculous, he exaggerates the yeah. the emotion that he's creating. So I I don't know where I was getting to with this, but yeah, it's but it's, it's a, but it's an interesting idea. But it's like that it's if you want to say something inappropriate or like a little bit at like edgier that it's like you have to find some way in your delivery or your response after you say it to like communicate the fact that you're like relax i'm joking yeah you yeah, know yeah. uh uh so let me see if i have any other uh things that i was gonna say oh one thing is you know he tells in that special he does the story about uh his friend who's like wants to follow her dreams and she's like it's stupid yeah and then I love that yeah part. like yeah. i want to bang the wu-tang clan and then he's doing this whole thing he's like nine dicks like that's so many dicks uh and that uh then he's like he's like if you feel if you, i feel like you guys aren't appreciating how many dicks that is he's like imagine if i had nine cinnamon rolls this morning <laughs> And that's like my favorite type of comedy when you take something and then you just give like another kind of example or mm. whatever. And it's like that killed me so hard because you are you're like, you're like, I have nine dicks. And then you're like nine fucking cinnamon rolls. That's disgusting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. that, that whole bit is, is like also I remember like before we started the podcast, I also told you about that because he closes that with like a more heartfelt speech mm -hmm. about how you should manage your expectation and your dreams and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I love that bit already because he's actually like wanting to give you a lesson, but he does it in a fucking hilarious way. So that's also something that I aspire to, something that uh, Chappelle does a lot and stuff like that. He's like talking about something serious, mm -hmm. but in a hilarious way. But then, yeah, the whole nine dicks is uh, yeah. <laughs> like he, he th says something like uh, I would be exhausted after two right? yeah. or something like, <laughs> yeah. it's like the, the head movement. And uh, imagine <laughs> being that girl and after two dicks realizing yeah. you have like seven <laughs> dudes left, you know, <laughs> is, yeah, that that bit is that, that was I thought that was really good. And it, it, it integrates a bunch of components, right? Because the 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 cinnamon rolls is like amazing in that it like it's a better example of access than this. yeah it connects you to it in a way that's like you can have access to it in a different way you're like oh yeah that makes me feel sick and then yeah. you're like oh jesus nine dicks <laughs> and exactly it's like people are more accustomed to talking about excess in regards to food yeah than in regards to dicks right <laughs> <So> yeah <that's, laughs> <laughs> but like at the same time, the bit has a bunch of, of like elements into it. The, this comparison, then also like the whole when he explains how many people are in the Wu Tang Clan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a story. Like that bit is like <laughs> one of the things about Tom Segura is just masterful comedy. Like really, like seven tools or or whatever many tools in one bit. Like it's, yeah, it's not a guy who's doing. Uh, nine dicks are like nine cinnamon rolls and then yeah. uh, seven this is like he's not a comparison he guy. yeah he saves it to this point where it's like he's he's taken the story where you're like where is he gonna go with this and then it's like this super simple food comparison but in that moment it's like fucking perfect exactly exactly like he knows how to do everything basically and in the to tell this story and to deliver this deeper message of ma managing your expectations and your dreams he uses every tool at the perfect moment, you know? Yeah. Because he could have done something like nine dicks is a lot, how much is a lot, and then use use something else. But the perfect one there, it was the fucking nine yeah. cinnamon <laughs> rolls, you know? He's just, yeah, he's 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 fucking great. Yeah. And he has a new special coming out soon, I think. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Amazing. I'm excited as hell. Um, one other, the last thing I'll, I'll say about the, the, the other note, the thing that struck me was he has this bit at the beginning of the special, um, about like the two acceptable answers to how are you doing, which is like good <laughs> and fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I thought was like masterful about what he did that is like, he does like a whole story, you know, about this guy at the bank and, uh, letting yeah. him in and stuff. And then at the end he gets to like, I'm like, what I'm guessing is actually, was the core of the joke, you know, like the thesis where he's like, 
there's two acceptable answers to how you're doing. It's good or okay, fine. Don't yeah. burden me with your bullshit if you're not doing good, you know? Exactly, yeah. Uh, and it's like, that was that was also like it's something that made me think like, okay, yeah, right. Like sometimes I feel like you come up with a thesis and then it's like, oh, you can build up like a whole thing in front of it and get to it. You know, you don't have to present start the present the thesis first. Yeah, 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 for sure. I, yeah, I actually like Ori explained that to me for the first time. Like he was like, when you write a joke, why? Like, why, what is it? What's your thesis, basically? And when you know the why, you, you, you can put it anywhere, mm -hmm. right? And you can, sometimes it's better at the beginning. Sometimes it's better at the beginning and then at the end again. Like, for, you can say something like, uh, I don't know, a catcalling is f a feminism. Yeah. People are like, what the fuck? Then you do this whole bit and then you see, see, catcalling is feminism or something like that. Yeah. Or, or, uh, uh, yeah, you can do it at the end or whatever. But what Ori told me and I thought I found like simple, but genius is like when you write a joke, having that thesis in mind and where to put it and how mm. to deliver it is, is like crucial. Yeah. That's such a good point. Yeah. Remembering like what is the point of why am I telling this joke? Yeah, and you can you can like figure it out after you write it and then just polish it. But, yeah. Like if a, if a joke doesn't have a why, it's confusing, right? Yeah. It's just yeah. confusing. Well, and I think that's something that like someone like Chris Rock does super well. It's like he presents his thesis a lot of times, like three or four times. You know, he gives you the premise yeah. continually through the joke and yeah. And each time it sounds more logical. Like yeah. Each time. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, this was super fun, man. Yeah, thank you. Really thank was. you for, for, for coming. Uh, please tell the people uh, where they can find you. Of course, I'm going to put the links in the description below. Nice. But uh, you have a show. Yeah, if yeah, pe yeah. people are in Berlin, they should come check it out. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, at uh, Hermann Schultz Cafe every Wednesday, 8.30. It's intimate. It's great. It's a one wonderful show. And you can see Patrick there almost every two weeks. <laughs> every two yeah. weeks, baby. <laughs> Elway signs yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great, and people yeah. can follow you on Instagram. On Instagram at Bruno Chill, please. At Bruno Chill, please. PLS, Link in the description yeah. below. Below, below, uh, and uh, follow him and come check out some of his shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's it. I think. Yeah, that I think we covered it. Yeah, and otherwise, I'll be moving to Cologne in in, in April. So if you have, so if a, you're in Cologne, if you're in Cologne or you have a mic in Cologne, please <laughs> yeah. let's do this. I need yeah. some comedy in my life. Uh, nice, but this was fun, man. Yeah, Thank it was you. Very fun. Cool. <laughs>